Okay, today we're going to continue on in, in 1 Peter. I don't know, did, if you, did you all get the notes? If you didn't get notes, raise your hand and we'll, we'll get some to you. Um, I do want to uh, pray before uh, we go into the message today. Um, so Father God, we thank you again for this day where we can come and worship you. Lord, I pray for wisdom. I pray for the, that the Spirit of God would be with me. Help me, Lord, as I preach your word, that you would be honored and glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. As I prepare a message, I always ask the Lord that he'll give me confidence as I preach. And confidence can only come through the study of the Word of God, knowing um, what it is that, that God is saying. And my favorite psalm is Psalm 19, and, and it starts out, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Um, it's talking about the general revelation of God uh, through his creation, to his creation, and specifically mankind. But when it goes on to... Um, in this psalm, it begins to talk about a direct revelation. And in verse 7, I'm going to read verses 7 through the end, it says this, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I will be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Now, if that doesn't get you excited, you may be dead, okay? And uh, you check your pulse, maybe, or, you know, if the person next to you is not moving, you want to check theirs, maybe. But this is where we go. It is the Word of God is where we go in prayer, asking the Spirit of God to enlighten us in, in what He is saying. So let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse, verses 1 and 2, and it's up on the screen so you can see it, but it's valuable for you to turn there in your own Bible because we are going to be uh, going further down in chapter 1 and even into chapter 2 a little bit uh, as we refer to them. If you don't have a Bible, there's Bibles uh, there for you uh, to use, and, and you can, um, can have the Bible if you want. But it says this, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood May grace and peace be multiplied to you. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. So first, meeting the writer, John Andrew uh, did a great job last week of introducing Peter, who has written about more than any other apostle in the New Testament. Uh, he is an interesting character for sure, uh, who miserably failed the Lord and ended up serving him in a greater way than most, certainly in a greater way than I ever have. Being an apostle puts Peter 
in an elite group of men who were personally called, commissioned, and ministered with Christ after his resurrection. The church was built upon their teaching as well as the prophets as we read in the book of Ephesians. But the Spirit of God is using Peter here in a special way to write a letter to these believers that we are going to meet today. The next slide shows us a map. Now, he ends the letter this way in chapter 5, by Silvanius, a faithful brother, as I regard him, I have written briefly to you. And what he's referring to as Silvanius was the scribe. He was the guy that was actually putting the pen on the paper, exhorting and declaring this, that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. So everything you're reading in this letter, stand firm in it. She, the church, who is at Babylon, and what he's probably referring to there is Rome, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. We read the book of Mark, which was penned by John Mark, and that's who Peter is referring to here. Greet one another with the kiss of love, peace to all of you who are in Christ. So meeting these readers on this map up here, you can see the area that these believers are at, and it's the area of what we call Turkey today. Uh, you can see Israel and Jerusalem down in the bottom right-hand corner. And also, you know, these are places that Paul visited and wrote to. You can see some of those names up there. Uh, you can see Rome, where Peter is writing from. And uh, he mentions Babylon, and again, most scholars assume that he is referring to Rome when he says Babylon, uh, just as a code, apparently. So let's go back to the slide where First Peter um, is, is written there. Um, the very first description that is given of the readers is that they are elect. Now, if you have a King James Bible, you'll see that elect is moved down to verse 2. But in the ESV, it is put first. And in many of, um, of the versions, it is moved around in those first two verses. As I'm sure many of you know, um, the translation from uh, the Greek in the Bible is not a word-for-word -word translation. There isn't a word for every Greek word that's, that's in the Bible, and sometimes it's several words that are uh, put into uh, that translation. So it's difficult to take from the original uh, language and put it into the many languages that are around today. So, for instance, this Greek word here, E-K-L-E-K-T-O-S, eklektos, now, the people in Joy Club know that some of my pronunciations aren't good, but it's usually the English language that I have a problem with, not Greek, for whatever reason. But the reason is, is that it's so simple in today's world with the technology that we have that you can just push a button on your computer and it pronounces it for you, so you can look really smart in front of a bunch of people. So, um, this word... Eklektos, is translated in the King James Version 16 times as elect and seven times as chosen. Depending on the total context of what was being written, they would take those words, and just like in the English language, we have very similar words that mean the same thing, really. Uh, there's not much of a difference between elect and chosen. But the basic meaning of this word is chosen, called out ones, picked out by God. You know, one of the happiest days of your life might be when you receive a letter saying that you have been chosen or accepted by a college or a university. But this is being chosen by God. Not another human for some sort of achievement of yours, but by God because of his will. And he's telling these people, here that he's writing to, that they are chosen, that they're elect. Jesus said in John 15, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Same word, or uh, 
same root word in the Greek, and it is pronounced eklegomai. So, eklektos, eklegomai, similar words again like we would have in English that mean basically the same thing. Later in chapter 2, uh, of P- Peter says this to these believers, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's the purpose, that you might um, proclaim the excellencies of God. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. This is the difference. This is what makes these people the elect. Election or God choosing is very common in Scripture. In Jeremiah, we read what Jeremiah says about himself. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you, or I set you aside. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. So we know that God chose Abraham. He chose Moses, each of the prophets. He chose David, a man after his own heart, to lead his nation. And speaking of that nation, God also chose groups of people, right? Israel. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, we read, For you are a people, holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. We could go on and on in Scripture. We have elections here in America. We choose our elected leaders. So Peter refers to these people as the chosen or elect, and it's, it's an easy concept for us to understand. It's also interesting that he calls them elect exiles together. From the full context we will see that they are elect or chosen by God himself. How should I react to being one of the elect? It should humble me. It should humble you. It should cause us to be obedient to God. Because as he said here about Israel, he chose them because of his love. And we should give that love back. All of the instruction in the book of First Peter relates back to the doctrine of election. And we're going to see that as we go through this book. It's a hard thing to study. At the same time, these people are uh, elect, they're exiles. They're aliens. I read the other day that 130,000 minor children have come across our southern border here in the United States just in the last couple of years and are now aliens in a foreign nation. No parents with them or ability to ever see them again. must be horrible for these children who are put in this position. It's not what we would call a normal childhood. It's not the childhood I had I can't imagine these kids wanting mom or dad, but being unable to ever see them, maybe never see them again. And I know someone who's in that position as an adult now. The people Peter is writing to were aliens stuck in a foreign land as their citizenship is in heaven. They are elect and adopted by God as his children. What an encouragement to know 
that yes, I'm an alien in this world, but I have a God who knows who I am. He has adopted me. Peter refers to them as exiles or aliens of the dispersion. Now, the dispersion is referred to generally uh, as the dispersion of the Jews throughout the world. However, here we are looking at something different. Most scholars believe that Peter is writing to Gentiles here in these parts of the world. Certainly there were Jews in this part of the world, but for the most part it was Gentile. Much of this interpretation comes from reading the entire book. You'll see that as you go. But Paul writes to the believers in Philippi, he says, but our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. As Americans, we have a tradition. It is to complain a lot about our elected officials. But isn't it great to see here that as believers, our citizenship is not in the United States of America, but it's in heaven. President Biden, Governor Hochul are not my king. Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, is my king. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, Jesus, and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Our King is a righteous King, and His kingdom is based on righteousness. There is no injustice. He has a rule of law that is just and righteous. Jesus told Pilate His kingdom was not of this world, and Peter is reminding these people of the same thing. These people were being treated in a way that we have no idea of. In AD 64, Rome had a tremendous fire. And about a third of the city was destroyed. Historians believe that Emperor Nero had the fire set so that he could rebuild the city even greater than it was. His home also burned in that fire. Although historians blame Nero, Nero blamed the Christians at the time. They were an easy target. He said they set the fire. So what did Nero do? He would tie Christians to a stake and cover them with pitch and light them on fire to illuminate his gardens at night. We have all heard and seen in movies as Christians were fed to lions in the arenas of Rome. Not all persecution was that severe, but no doubt these believers lived in fear for their lives. If you're at 1 Peter uh, chapter 1 in your Bible, starting in verse 3, Peter says this to these people who were under persecution. Peter and Paul were both martyred during this very time. It uh, was shortly after, obviously, Peter had written this letter, or the letters that he wrote. But it says this in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And listen to this, to an inheritance that is imperishable. It's not going to perish. It's undefiled, unfading. Where is it kept? It's kept in heaven for you. Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. What is the outcome of your faith? It's the salvation 
of your soul. Peter is encouraging these people living in a very difficult situation. Their faith is being tested in extraordinary ways, but they are not of this world. They have a king, and his name is Jesus. We should remember that. But also, later in the second chapter, writing to these very same uh, people, Peter says this to them. Be subject, for the Lord's sake, to every human institution, whether it be the emperor, okay, Nero, the guy I just explained about, as supreme, or to governors, as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor who? The emperor, Nero. We also need to remember this. As we live in a difficult time ourselves, we may not like our leaders, but we're to be subject to the authorities. Why? It says, for the Lord's sake. However, the same man Peter said in the book of Acts, it's better to obey God than to obey men. We cannot go into this now other than to say that we are to respect our government, as we're told to here. That God has put in place, for his reason, whatever it is, and the line that cannot be crossed is when we're, they are doing something or promoting something that goes against God's word. So let's move on here and let's meet the Trinity. So, we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God, as you see up on the screen here. We are elect by or in the sanctifying work, or the setting aside work of the Spirit of God. We are elect that we may obey Jesus Christ, that we might be an obedient people and be sprinkled by his blood, which is an interesting statement. We see the three dimensions of election here in the work of our triune God. C.H. Spurgeon said this, Nothing will so enlarge the intellect and magnify the whole soul of a man as a devout, earnest, continued investigation of the whole subject of the Trinity. We don't have time to do that today. If you've been in Joy Club, we have done that there. But uh, further, the subject of the Trinity is something that is important and it relates to election as it's connected here. Number one, the foreknowledge of God. This goes back to the fact that these people are chosen by God. They're the elect. So the question is, is when did God choose the elect? And how did it work? This is when I should leave the podium <laughs> and tell you to go to your Bibles and figure it out yourself, but I'm not going to do that. Did God just look down through time and say, John Cooper looks like he's going to be a nice guy. I think I'll choose him. No. Because when God looked down through time, he saw a sinner, an awful sinner. But it was through his grace, as we know, that he's chosen anyone. Our only way of knowing how God did this is to go to Scripture and compare Scripture with Scripture. We can't go into the Bible, as some people do, and, and take just part of it, a verse, and take it out of context and say, we're going to make something mean something by pulling it out of the context that it's in. We have to look at it as a whole, as a whole of Scripture. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, starting in verse 3. If you want to turn there, I'll read it. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose, eklegomai is the Greek word, chose us in him before the foundation of the world. And that word foundation, that Greek word, it's, you go into scripture and you look where that's used, it's always referred to as a foundation, a physical foundation. 
not always, but for the most part, that's what you see. So, again, as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. Is everybody in the world holy and blameless? No. We read our newspapers or we can just know the people we work with or maybe some people in our family. No, that's not the condition of the world. But it's to be the condition of the elect. That is why he elected them. And then we see this word in verse 5, which is even scarier. He predestined. Predizzo. Predetermined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. When? Before the foundation of the world, it says here. According to the purpose of his will, it says here. It's God's will. We have a sovereign God. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us, in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of, again, his will, according to his purpose, which he has set forth in Christ as a plan. God has a plan. For the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. When? Before the foundation of the world. Why? That we should be holy and blameless before him. What? He predestined predestined us for adoption as sons to himself through Jesus, how? through Jesus Christ according to his will. It's his salvation to offer as a plan for the fullness of time. According to the riches of his grace, it said, not according to anything any of us could do. We could not earn it in any way. We go to Romans chapter 8 and we love this first verse that I'll read in verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And we read that verse and we claim that promise and we say, I have a sovereign God who's working in my life. He's not going to allow anything that happens that is going to harm me. Everything's going to be for my good or for the good of my family. We love that verse 28. And we claim the sovereignty of God. Well, what about verse 29? You can't just throw away verse 29, can you? It says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, again, there's that word, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Again, most people are familiar with verse 28. And I've even had people who aren't believers tell me, yeah, everything always works out for the better, you know. But... We need to believe we have a sovereign God and that he works things out for good, yes. But where does God's sovereignty end? If we choose to reject what we're reading today here, right from Scripture, where does God's sovereignty end? With salvation? No. He's a totally sovereign God. It says in the following verse that he also predestined which means predetermined, decreed from eternity, foreordained those to be conformed to the image of his Son. In the next chapter, Romans 9, Paul makes choice of the elect before time very plain because he explains it in Romans chapter 9 when he says this, starting in verse 10, And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born, listen to this, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, 
not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means, Paul says. For he says it Mo- says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. These aren't my words. These are the word of God. Yes, this is hard to understand or accept. And really, it goes against human nature, doesn't it? But human nature is not God's nature. We might not think it's fair. But we have a sovereign God in all things who could have sent all of us to hell and needed no excuse but his mercy and his grace. It says he chose us for salvation if we know Christ. We don't have time today because it's already 11 o'clock and I knew that would happen to go into how free will and how election come into play to one another. They're not against each other. And you're going to have to keep coming as we go through 1 Peter to find out, right? But let's look at the the other part of the Trinity here, the sanctification of the Spirit. The objective of election is salvation. And it is the Spirit of God who consecrates us or who sets us apart for salvation. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 4, we read, For we know, brothers, <coughs> excuse me, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and the Lord for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia and for and not <clears throat> for not only was the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. Set apart for salvation by the Spirit of God, by the work of the Holy Spirit, as we read here in 1 Peter. And then we read about obedience to Christ. So we see the full Trinity here involved in this. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God. It's, it's, it's God's salvation that he is giving as a gift, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship. This is God's work in salvation. We're his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. If it wasn't for the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, we wouldn't be talking about salvation, would we? but created in Christ Jesus. Why? For good works, which God prepared when? Beforehand, that we should walk in them. The purpose of our salvation is that we are chosen, set apart for obedience, good works, which God has prepared when? Beforehand. It's interesting that Peter adds this here about the sprinkling of his blood. Um, And it's in reference to Exodus chapter 24, and and we don't go splattering blood on people here, at least I haven't heard of that. I hope that's not going on. But he's referring to Exodus chapter 24, verses 4 through 8. It says this, And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. Remember, God was speaking to Moses. He was giving him his word to give to the people. 
He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars, according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do, and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance to all these words. The blood is directly related to what? Obedience. I was listening to a message yesterday, and it, it said there that um, there are more references to Christ's suffering in First Peter than in any other book in Scripture. Now, obviously, Peter was there, right? He saw it. Why? Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Christ's blood is the perfect atonement for our sin, for my sin. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Peter ends the greeting in this book here with grace and peace be multiplied to you. It's worthy to note that without grace, the grace that God offers, there is no peace. The two are related. If you're here today and don't know Christ, Scripture tells us that you're at war with God. You're at enmity with God. The same God who is offering peace with Him through the blood of His Son. Jesus Christ. If you don't know Christ today, um, make it a point to see one of us after the service this morning. So that is the message for today.